Our guest today in the world after coronavirus is Lucy Hutira. Uh, Lucy is a professor here at Boston University in our Department of Earth and Environment. And we're going to ask her what she thinks the future of CO2 emissions might look like in a post-COVID world. I don't know what the future holds, but we have some really large choices before us. Before COVID, we were on track to see a 1% growth in global fossil fuel emissions. So we were on track not to reduce emissions, but to continue our steady pace of growing emissions. Since the shutdowns that started in March, global emissions are estimated to have gone down 5.5%. We've never observed a drop in emissions of 5.5%. The global recession, the Second World War, the Spanish flu, none of these things caused a decline in emissions like what we're seeing in COVID. We're in uncharted territory. And with those declines in emissions, it's not just CO2, it's and it's NO2, it's methane, it's a range of different you know, industrial products. And our air is changing. We're seeing skies in a way that we didn't before. We're seeing water clarity that hadn't been observed before. And we're being exposed to a different notion of what our environment could look like. And what happens when we go back? Do people um, take the subway? Or does our insane traffic become even worse because people are afraid of that? Or does it turn out that Zoom works pretty well for a lot of our meetings. Do we prop up the fossil fuel industry? Or do we, as we did during the recession, choose to make an investment in green technologies? We've experienced a reality that was unthinkable. And there's been a lot of pain with that reality, but we've also realized some things are possible that we didn't think were. We have talked about the human behavior, about policy behavior, but how does science behave in all of this? How does the atmosphere behave to these changes? It depends on what compound you're looking at. So most of my study focuses on CO2. And in the case of CO2, we don't actually see a signal yet. And that's because we have large processes that are governing the system. We have uh, photosynthesis, we have, re- we have respiration, and the atmosphere is vast, and we have weather. And uh, COVID also sp- struck in the spring. And so the, the timing of when this incident happened was right as our planet was transitioning from one dominated by um, biological release of carbon through decomposition and respiration to all of a sudden leaves coming out on trees and the ecosystems around us starting to take up carbon. It's also comparatively small in terms of the natural cycle of CO2 around us. So we are unlikely, even with these large drops in fossil fuel emissions, to see in our um, keeling curve and the march up and down in our atmospheric CO2, we're unlikely to see a clear signal from this unless it's sustained. The atmosphere also has an inertia. If you imagine a bathtub as our atmosphere, it is full of CO2 and we have slowed down the faucet of what we're adding to this large bathtub, but it takes time before that bathtub can drain. And in the case of uh, CO2 in the atmosphere, it's many years. So uh, this is a big blip in terms of emissions at the moment, but we're not going to see it in the atmospheric CO2 concentrations very clearly um, unless it's sustained. Let me ask this. Uh, In a post-COVID world, what is your greatest fear? My greatest fear is that we uh, double down on the energy investments that got us into this. Um, There is a tremendous amount of recovery and stimulus money that's being allocated by the government right now. And those choices of which industries are supported and to which extent is picking winners and losers. And that picking um, will have a lasting impact because if we choose to prop up the dirtiest industries in terms of what their fossil fuel emissions look like 
that will lock us in on a trajectory that will last for years, far beyond a political cycle. Obvious, obvious other question. Um, your greatest hopes? We've learned a lot about our resilience through this experiment. We've learned a lot about how we can do things differently. And it's been an incredible opportunity for us to rethink and envision some alternative realities on how we spend our time and how we spend our dollars and who in our society is, is particularly valued. And I think that that could translate into some really key behavioral changes. And those behavioral changes could have a lasting impact on what our greenhouse gases look like.